Let's just bow our heads for a moment, shall we? Prayer friends, as I pray that my words will be in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, no less. Amen. Okay, the message this morning is, quote, Have you ever had one of those days? A bad day. A day where you think, oh boy, where do I go from here? And you're a Christian and uh, you tend to think, well, should I be having bad days? Somebody's liable to come along and say, remember, this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. And you think, well, yeah, yeah, but you don't know my situation. (laughs) And sometimes um, we wonder, how do we handle it? What do we do? Where do we turn to? What scriptures, if necessary, do we fall back on? I'd like to read you... um, A passage from Acts chapter 16, if those of you who would like to turn to it, it's Acts chapter 16, verses 16 to 34. I'm actually going to read it to you in a a version I don't normally use. It's called The Message. It's a very up-to-date contemporary version. And the reason I've chosen this particular uh, version of the Bible is it's it's very colourful. It's very, very graphic. Concerns, of course, the Apostle Paul, who used to get himself in all sorts of scrapes, didn't he, for the Lord? And this particular time, well, just listen in now to what happened. This is Paul speaking. He says, one day, we were on our way to the place of prayer, and a slave girl ran into us. She was a psychic, and, with her fortune-telling, made a lot of money for the people who owned her. She started following Paul around, calling everyone's attention to us by yelling out, These men are working for the Most High God. They're laying out the road of salvation for you. And she did this for a number of days until Paul, finally fed up with her, turned and commanded the spirit that possessed her, Out! In the name of Jesus, get out of her. And it was gone. Just like that. When her owners saw that their lucrative little business was suddenly bankrupt... They went after Paul and Silas, roughed them up and dragged them into the market square. Then the police arrested them and pulled them into a court with the accusation, these men are disturbing the peace. Dangerous Jewish agitators subversing our room and law and order. And by this time the crowd had turned into a restless mob out for blood. The judges went along with the mob, had Paul and Silas' clothes ripped off and ordered a public beating. After beating them black and blue, they threw them into jail, telling the jailkeeper to put them under heavy guard so there would be no chance of escape. And he did just that. Threw them into the maximum security cell in the jail and clamped leg irons on them. Along about midnight, Paul and Silas were at prayer and singing a robust hymn to God. The other prisoners couldn't believe their ears. And then, without warning, a huge earthquake The jailhouse tottered, every door flew open, all the prisoners were loose. Startled from sleep, the jailers saw that all the doors swinging loose on their hinges were were there swinging on their hinges, and assuming that all the prisoners had escaped, he pulled out his sword and was about to do himself in, figuring he he was as good as dead anyway, when Paul stopped him. Don't do that, we're all still here. Nobody's run away. The jailer got a torch and ran inside. Badly shaken, he collapsed in front of Paul and Silas. He led them out of the jail and asked, Sirs, what do I have to do to be saved, to really live? And they said, Put your entire trust in Master Jesus. Then you'll live as you were meant to live, and everyone in your house included. They went on to spell out in detail the story of the Master. The entire family got in on this part. They Never did get to bed that night. The jailer made them feel at home, dressed their wounds, and then, he couldn't wait till morning, was baptised. He and everyone in his family. There in his home he had food set out for a festive meal. It was a night to remember. He and his entire family had put their trust in God. Everyone in the house was in on the celebration. Well... During the New Testament, during during this particular reading, we hear of an adventure in Greece, because that's what it was. There's Paul and Silas, they're on a missionary journey, and it was in the area of Philippi, and initially things to be going pretty well. Okay, uh, pretty much, but one day, as we've just read, things began to change, and a certain woman who was a fortune teller 
began to follow Paul and Cyrus declaring, these men are proclaiming the way to salvation. Now, at first it might seem like a good thing. I mean, you know, free advertising. But this didn't just happen once or twice. She kept up the chant for several days. Having appeared at first to be a good thing, it was then becoming a nuisance, a distraction. It's a little bit like me being up here, hopefully giving God's message or Bill doing the same. And somebody comes through that door and shouts, yeah, praise the Lord. Yeah, 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 grace. Listen to him. He's good. He's God. And we think, well, okay, yeah, fine. Thanks very much. But he goes on and on and on. And you tend to think, all right, mate, okay, you've made your point. Uh, and in the end, we get irritated by it, don't we? Well, we would do, wouldn't we, Bill? He's nodding. Yeah, okay. Now, in actual fact, Paul and Silas, or the Paul, was thinking, well, he realised that this particular woman had got a demon in her. And she was being used by certain influential men in the community to make money. And the coffers were suffering. And they saw that it was Paul and Silas that had done the damage, so they seized them, dragged them into the marketplace. They were having a bad day. Things just got from bad to worse. They were brought before a makeshift court and were stripped, severely beaten. And bear in mind that Paul was a Roman citizen and you were not allowed to do that. But it happened. They were thrown into the inner prison where their feet were fastened in stocks. This had been a bad day. Have you ever had one of those bad days? Not exactly like Paul. But one day where you tend to think, you know, one thing goes on, another thing seems to hit you. One of those days when you just told someone, well, at least it can't get any worse, can it? <laughs> but it does. How then do you react? Let me just share with you, again, three examples of what I'm talking about, very, very briefly. Some of the people who probably earn the right to a bad day, true stories. There was a man in London, apparently, who was so mad and so annoyed that he'd been given a speeding ticket that he raced away from the officer, absolutely furious that he got the speeding ticket with his tyres screeching. So the officer raced after him, gave him a second speeding ticket on the spot, and added a third one for making unnecessary noise. And in Antwerp, in Belgium, there was a, a chap who was burglar, burglarising a house, a thief, he fled out the back door, clambered over a nine-foot wall and dropped down into the city prison. And a woman came home to find her husband in the kitchen, shaking frantically with what looked like a wire running from his waist towards the electric kettle. And intending to knock him free from the deadly current, she found a large piece of wood and whacked him on the arm, breaking his arm in two places. He had only been listening to his Walkman tape player. The text in Acts clearly indicates that the Apostle Paul and Silas were having one of those days. And bad days can only get worse for those who don't know Jesus. What about you? Have you ever had a bad day or a bad week? Nobody's not in it. All have had good weeks. I have anyway. In fact, if we're not serving Christ or we're not in his will, those days are going to get pretty stressful. But thank God if we confess our sins, if he's faithful to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness... All's going to be fine, but an unrighteous man hasn't really got a lot of hope of things getting significantly better. The, don't turn to this, but the prophet Amos describes an unrighteous man. This is one verse in Amos, the book of Amos. An unrighteous man is one who runs from a lion, meets a bear, and then when he gets to his house, he leans on the wall in exhaustion, only to have a snake bite him. Now that's a bad day. Amos 5.19 And for those who are not ready yet to meet the Lord, the days are going to get even worse. Revelation says they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Friends, it's not a particular doctrine that's very popular these days, but it's there in the Bible. It always has been, and it's not going to change. So we have to pay attention to these things, do we not? Whilst it's true that even a child of God can have a bad day, a bad day will not have the last word because God has the last word. And his word in Psalm, Psalm 30 says, Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. And again in Romans, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and to those who have been called according to his purpose. And again in John, we see God's promises for his children. In the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. 
I have overcome the world. So how do you turn around a bad day? How did Paul and Silas handle it? Well, in verse 25 of, of what I read, it says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. That is actually is quite something in itself when you think about it. The victory in overcoming bad days comes down to this simple equation. Prayer plus praise equals deliverance. Prayer plus praise equals deliverance. The victory in overcoming bad days comes down to this simple question. Prayer plus praise equals deliverance. First we must begin with prayer. Start by calling on the name of the Lord. A simple prayer from the heart. A time one-on-one -on -one with the Lord, the God that loves us so much. And then listen, remember Christ's promise to us. My sheep, hear my voice. My yoke is easy and my burden is light, says the Lord. Have you ever used the term, take it easy on yourself? Maybe somebody else has said to you, look, take it easy on yourself. You know, as Christians, we need to do that. Have you ever been in a situation which caused you great distress and you didn't know where to turn? The Lord says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Give it to Jesus. He's already made the sacrifice. He's already paid the price. We heard about it in communion this morning. Exactly the same. Sometimes our bad days are bad days simply because we do not take it to the Lord in prayer. You've got your hymn books at the moment. Just turn to hymn number 746. 746. Do that and you'll see that the hymn was written by a guy called Joseph Scribbins. Now he became keenly aware of the power of prayer. It sustained him when he seemed lost in his life. You see, Joseph's fiance drowned the night before their scheduled wedding. Soon after, when his mother was ill, he wrote his mother a letter and enclosed the lines of a new poem he had written. We know the words of this poem as the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. In the first verse, Joseph expressed this ironic truth. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Tell you what, stay seated. Let's just sing the first verse. We can do it without being accompanied. Just the first verse. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and grace to bear, all the praise of which to carry, everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often fall. to his presence, an open line in time of need, isn't it? There's a story of the son who went to, went to jump on, on the bumper of his dad's lorry in order to hitch a short ride across the, year, uh, across the yard, and his dad didn't see him. And he slid down and was being dragged for several yards before his dad heard him screaming. And the father ran around the back of the truck where his son was still holding on to the bumper. And he could see that he was okay, just a little scraped up on the knees and all that. But he just had to ask the obvious question. Why didn't you let go? And God must be looking at us and wondering, why didn't you let go? Why didn't you let go of your fears, your stress, your worries? Don't let Satan drag you through life battered and scarred. So how do we turn around a bad day? A day where we sense that things aren't going too brilliantly or it's obvious that they're not going to? When a storm comes, pray and God will sustain us. Secondly, continue with praise. After Paul and Silas prayed, they began to sing hymns of praise to God. 
You know, I've read that passage a few times, I think most of us have in our lives, and I've always wondered what the other prisoners must have thought who were already in there. And these two guys came in and started singing hymns of praise at midnight. They must have think, gosh, we've been joined by a couple of nutters. What on earth? <laughs> but it worked, didn't it? It worked. They prayed and they trusted God, so what else is there to do but speak the language of faith? Whether it's in a song or in a word, praise is that language of faith. The eyes of man would have tried to convince Paul and Silas that their situation hadn't changed and there was nothing to sing about. But through eyes of faith they saw that God had not forsaken them. Prayer plus praise equals deliverance. And even though it had been a bad day up to this point, even though they were in prison and chained in the stocks, God was with them. It takes faith to praise God when the day has been bad. It takes faith to sing praises to the Lord for what he's done. While those around you, it doesn't look as though the Lord hasn't done anything. It might appear that the Lord hasn't done anything, but that doesn't matter. If we know he has and he's going to and he will, that's all that matters to us. But once we've prayed and put our problems in God's hands, what else is there to do but praise him? It's the hardest thing to do if your earthly, worldly logic tells you, what do I do now, or asks the question. It's the last thing you want to do in some ways, but it's the thing that works. To do anything less is to suggest that God either doesn't hear or doesn't care. And if we believe he hears and we know he cares, then let's praise him. There is a song, I'm not going to sing it. And he goes, whenever I am, wherever I am, I'll praise him. Wherever I can, I'll praise him. For his love surrounds me like a sea. I'll praise the name of Jesus, lift the name of Jesus, for the name of Jesus lifted me. But does anybody know that? Has anybody heard of it? Yeah. Oh, Joy has. Yeah, okay. A lot of truth in that. Let's remember to pray, but also remember to praise him. As Paul and, Paul and Silas were singing, the prison was shaking, the doors were opened, and they were delivered. Now, that's a pretty good day. God was truly working all things together for good. Let's hold on to this supernatural truth. Prayer plus praise equals deliverance. The life of a Christian embodies this simple truth. So let's praise him together in the precious words of the doxology as we finish now. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son and Holy Ghost. <laughs>